Bingo, The Story of My Dog, a short story of loyalty by Ernest Thompson Seton. One. It was early in November, 1882, and the Manitoba winter had just set in. I was tilting back in my chair for a few lazy moments after breakfast, idly alternating my gaze from the one window pane of our shanty through which was framed a bit of the prairie in the end of our cowshed to the old rhyme of the Franklin's dogger pinned on the logs nearby. But the dreamy mixture of rhyme and view was quickly dispelled by the sight of a large grey animal dashing across the prairie into the cowshed with a smaller black and white animal in hot pursuit. A wolf, I exclaimed, and seizing a rifle dashed out to help the dog but before I could get there, they had left the stable, and after a short run over the snow, the wolf again turned at bay, and the dog, our neighbour's collie, circled about watching his chance to snap. I fired a couple of long shots, which had the effect only of setting them off again over the prairie. After another run, this matchless dog closed and seized the wolf by the haunch, but again retreated to avoid the fierce return chop. Then there was another stand at bay, and again, a race over the snow. Every few hundred yards this scene was repeated, the dog managing so that each fresh rush should be toward the settlement, while the wolf vainly tried to break back toward the dark belt of trees in the east. At last, after a mile of this fighting and running, I overtook them, and the dog, seeing that he now had good backing, closed in for the finish. After a few seconds, the whirl of struggling animals resolved itself into a wolf on his back, with a bleeding collie gripping his throat, and it was now easy for me to step up and end the fight by putting a ball through the wolf's head. Then, when this dog of marvellous wind saw that his foe was dead, he gave him no second glance, but set out at a lope for a farm four miles across the snow, where he had left his master when first the wolf was started. He was a wonderful dog and even if I had not come, he undoubtedly would have killed the wolf alone, as I learned he had already done with others of the kind, in spite of the fact that the wolf, though of the smaller or prairie race, was much larger than himself. I was filled with admiration for the dog's prowess, and at once sought to buy him at any price. The scornful reply of his owner was, Why don't you try to buy one of the children? Since Frank was not in the market, I was obliged to content myself with the next best thing, one of his alleged progeny, that is, a son of his wife. This probable offspring of an illustrious sire was a roly-poly ball of black fur that looked more like a long-tailed bear cub than a puppy. But he had some tan markings like those on Frank's coat that were, I hoped, guarantees of future greatness and also a very characteristic ring of white that he always wore on his muzzle. Having got possession of his person, the next thing was to find him a name. Surely this puzzle was already solved. The rhyme of the Franklin's dogger was inbuilt with the foundation of our acquaintance, so with adequate pomp we are clept him little Bingo. 2. The rest of that winter, Bingo spent in our shanty, living the life of a blubbery, fat, well-meaning, ill-doing puppy, gorging himself with food and growing bigger and clumsier each day. Even sad experience failed to teach him that he must keep his nose out of the rat trap. His most friendly overtures to the cat were wholly misunderstood and resulted only in an armed neutrality that varied by occasional reigns of terror continued to the end, which came when Bingo, who early showed a mind of his own, got a notion for sleeping at the barn and avoiding the shanty altogether. When the spring came, I set about his serious education. After much pains on my behalf and many pains on his, he learned to go at the word in quest of our old yellow cow that pastured at will on the unfenced prairie. Once he had learned his business, he became very fond of it, and nothing pleased him more than an order to go and fetch the cow. Away he would dash, barking with pleasure and leaping high in the air that he might better scan the plain for his victim. In a short time he would return driving her at full gallop before him and gave her no peace until puffing and blowing she was safely driven into the farthest corner of her stable. Less energy on his part would have been more satisfactory, but we bore with him until he grew so fond of this semi-daily hunt that he began to bring old Dunn 
without being told. And at length, not once or twice, but a dozen times a day, this energetic cowherd would sally forth on his own responsibility and drive the cow home to the stable. At last, things came to such a pass that whenever he felt like taking a little exercise, or had a few minutes of spare time, or even happened to think of it, Bingo would sally forth at racing speed over the plain and a few minutes later return, driving the unhappy yellow cow at full gallop before him. At first, this did not seem very bad, as it kept the cow from straying too far, but soon it was seen that it hindered her feeding. She became thin and gave less milk. It seemed to weigh on her mind, too, as she was always watching nervously for that hateful dog, and in the mornings would hang around the stable as though afraid to venture off and subject herself at once to an onset. This was going too far. All attempts to make Bingo more moderate in his pleasure were failures, so he was compelled to give it up altogether. After this, though he dared not bring her home, he continued to show his interest by lying at her stable door while she was being milked. As the summer came on, the mosquitoes became a dreadful plague, and the consequent vicious switching of Dunn's tail at milking time was even more annoying than the mosquitoes. Fred, the brother who did the milking, was of an inventive as well as an impatient turn of mind, and he devised a simple plan to stop the switching. He fastened a brick to the cow's tail, then set blithely about his work, assured of unusual comfort, while the rest of us looked on in doubt. Suddenly, through the mist of mosquitoes came a dull whack and an outburst of language. The cow went on placidly chewing till Fred got on his feet and furiously attacked her with the milking stool. It was bad enough to be whacked on the ear with a brick by a stupid old cow, but the uproarious enjoyment and ridicule of the bystanders made it unendurable. Bingo, hearing the uproar and divining that he was needed, rushed in and attacked Dunn on the other side. Before the affair quieted down, the milk was spilt, the pail and stool were broken, and the cow and the dog severely beaten. Poor Bingo could not understand it at all. He had long ago learned to despise that cow, and now, in utter disgust, he decided to forsake even her stable door, and from that time be attached himself exclusively to the horses and their stable. The cattle were mine, the horses were my brothers, and in transferring his allegiance from the cow stable to the horse stable, Bingo seemed to give me up too, and anything like daily companionship ceased. And yet, whenever any emergency arose, Bingo turned to me and I to him, and both seemed to feel that the bond between man and dog is one that lasts as long as life. The only other occasion on which Bingo acted as cowherd was in the autumn of the same year at the annual Carberry Fair. Among the dazzling inducements to enter one's stock, there was, in addition to a prospect of glory, a cash prize of two dollars for the best collie in training. Misled by a false friend, I entered Bingo, and early on the day fixed, the cow was driven to the prairie just outside of the village. When the time came, she was pointed out to Bingo and the word given, Go fetch the cow. It was the intention, of course, that he should bring her to me at the judge's stand, but the animals knew better. They hadn't rehearsed all summer for nothing. When Dunn saw Bingo's careering form, she knew that her only hope for safety was to get it into her stable, and Bingo was equally sure that his sole mission in life was to quicken her pace in that direction. So off they raced over the prairie like a wolf after a deer, and heading straight toward their home two miles away, they disappeared from view. That was the last that judge or jury ever saw of dog or cow. The prize was awarded to the only other entry. Three. Bingo's loyalty to the horses was quite remarkable. By day he trotted beside them, and by night he slept at the stable door. Where the team went, Bingo went and nothing kept him away from them. This interesting assumption of ownership lent the greater significance to the following circumstance. I was not superstitious, and up to this time had had no faith in omens, but was now deeply impressed by a strange occurrence in which Bingo took a leading part. There were but two of us now living on the De Winton farm. One morning my brother set out for Boggy Creek for a load of hay. It was a long day's journey there and back, and he made an early start. 
Strange to tell, Bingo, for once in his life, did not follow the team. My brother called to him, but still he stood at a safe distance and, eyeing the team askance, refused to stir. Suddenly he raised his nose in the air and gave vent to a long, melancholy howl. He watched the wagon out of sight and even followed for a hundred yards or so, raising his voice from time to time in the most doleful howlings. All that day he stayed about the barn, the only time that he was willingly separated from the horses and at intervals howled a very death dirge. I was alone, and the dog's behaviour inspired me with an awful foreboding of calamity that weighed upon us more and more as the hours passed away. About six o'clock, Bingo's howlings became unbearable, so that for lack of a better thought I threw something at him and ordered him away. But oh, the feeling of horror that filled me! Why did I let my brother go away alone? Should I ever again see him alive? I might have known from the dog's actions that something dreadful was about to happen. At length, the hour for his return arrived, and there was John on his load. I took charge of the horses, vastly relieved, and with an air of assumed unconcern asked, All right? Right, was the laconic answer. Who now can say that there is nothing in omens? And yet when, long afterward, I told this to one skilled in the occult, he looked grave and said, Bingo always turned to you in a crisis. Yes. Then do not smile. It was you that were in danger that day. He stayed and saved your life, though you never knew from what. 4. Early in the spring, I had begun Bingo's education. Very shortly afterward, he began mine. Midway on the two-mile stretch of prairie that lay between our shanty and the village of Carbury was the corner stake of the farm. It was a stout post in a low mound of earth and was visible from afar. I soon noticed that Bingo never passed without minutely examining this mysterious post. Next, I learned that it was also visited by the prairie wolves as well as by all the dogs in the neighbourhood, and at length, with the aid of a telescope, I made a number of observations that helped me to an understanding of the matter and enabled me to enter more fully into Bingo's private life. The post was by common agreement a registry of the canine tribes. Their exquisite sense of smell enabled each individual to tell at once, by the track and trace, what other had recently been at the post. When the snow came much more was revealed. I then discovered that this post was but one of a system that covered the country, that, in short, the entire region was laid out in signal stations at convenient intervals. These were marked by any conspicuous post, stone, buffalo skull, or other object that chanced to be in the desired locality, and extensive observation showed that it was a very complete system for getting and giving the news. Each dog or wolf makes a point of calling at those stations that are near his line of travel to learn who has recently been there, just as a man calls at his club on returning to town and looks up the register. I have seen Bingo approach the post, sniff, examine the ground about, then growl, and with bristling mane and glowing eyes, scratch fiercely and contemptuously with his hind feet, finally walking off very stiffly, glancing back from time to time. All of which, being interpreted, said, Grr, woof, there's that dirty cur of McCarthy's. Woof, I'll tend to him tonight. Woof, woof. On another occasion, after the preliminaries, he became keenly interested and studied a coyote's track that came and went, saying to himself, as I afterward learned, a coyote track coming from the north, smelling of dead cow. Indeed, Polworth's old brindle must be dead at last. This is worth looking into. At other times he would wag his tail, trot about the vicinity, and come again and again to make his own visit more evident, perhaps for the benefit of his brother Bill just back from Brandon so that it was not by chance that one night Bill turned up at Bingo's at home and was taken to the hills, where a delicious dead horse afforded a chance to suitably celebrate the reunion. At other times, he would be suddenly aroused by the news, take up the trail, and race to the next station for later information. Sometimes his inspection produced only an air of grave attention, as though he said to himself, Dear me, who the deuce is this? Or, 
it seems to me I met that fellow at the portage last summer. One morning, on approaching the post bingo's every hair stood on end, his tail dropped and quivered, and he gave proof that he was suddenly sick at the stomach, sure signs of terror. He showed no desire to follow up or know more of the matter, but returned to the house, and half an hour afterward his mane was still bristling and his expression one of hate or fear. I studied the dreaded track and learned that in Bingo's language, the half-terrified, deep-gurgled Gerbawef means timber wolf. These were among the things that Bingo taught me, and in the aftertime when I might chance to see him arouse from his frosty nest by the stable door, and after stretching himself and shaking the snow from his shaggy coat, disappear into the gloom at a steady trot. Trot, trot, I used to think. Ah, old dog, I know where you're off to and why you eschew the shelter of the shanty. Now I know why your nightly trips over the country are so well-timed and how you know just where to go for what you want and when and how to seek it. 5. In the autumn of 1884, the shanty at De Winton Farm was closed and Bingo changed his home to the establishment, that is, to the stable, not the house, of Gordon Wright our most intimate neighbour. Since the winter of his puppyhood, he had declined to enter a house at any time excepting during a thunderstorm. Of thunder and guns he had a deep dread, no doubt the fear of the first originated in the second and that arose from some unpleasant shotgun experiences, the cause of which will be seen. His nightly couch was outside the stable, even during the coldest weather and it was easy to see he enjoyed to the full the complete nocturnal liberty entailed. Bingo's midnight wanderings extended across the plains for miles. There was plenty of proof of this. Some farmers at very remote points sent word to old Gordon that if he did not keep his dog home nights, they would use the shotgun, and Bingo's terror of firearms would indicate that the threats were not idle. A man living as far away as Petrel said, he saw a large black wolf kill a coyote on the snow one winter evening, but afterward he changed his opinion and reckoned it must have been Wright's dog. Whenever the body of a winter-killed ox or horse was exposed, Bingo was sure to repair to it nightly, and driving away the prairie wolves, feast to repletion. Sometimes the object of a night foray was merely to maul some distant neighbour's dog, and notwithstanding vengeful threats, there seemed no reason to fear that the bingo breed would die out. One man even avowed that he had seen a prairie wolf accompanied by three young ones which resembled the mother, excepting that they were very large and black and had a ring of white around the muzzle. True or not, as that may be, I know that late in March, while we were out in the sleigh with bingo trotting behind, a prairie wolf was started from a hollow. Away it went with Bingo in full chase, but the wolf did not greatly exert itself to escape, and within a short distance Bingo was close up, yet strange to tell, there was no grappling, no fight. Bingo trotted amiably alongside and licked the wolf's nose. We were astounded and shouted to urge Bingo on. Our shouting and approach several times started the wolf off at speed, and Bingo again pursued until he had overtaken it, but his gentleness was too obvious. It is a she-wolf, he won't harm her, I exclaimed as the truth dawned on me, and Gordon said, well I be darned. So we called our unwilling dog and drove on. For weeks after this we were annoyed by the depredations of a prairie wolf who killed our chickens, stole pieces of pork from the end of the house, and several times terrified the children by looking into the window of the shanty while the men were away. Against this animal, Bingo seemed to be no safeguard. At length, the wolf, a female, was killed, and then Bingo plainly showed his hand by his lasting enmity toward Oliver, the man who did the deed. 6. It is wonderful and beautiful how a man and his dog will stick to one another through thick and thin. Butler tells of an undivided Indian tribe in the far north, which was all but exterminated by an internecine feud over a dog that belonged to one man and was killed by his neighbour. And among ourselves, we have lawsuits, fights and deadly feuds, all pointing the same old moral, love me, love my dog. 
One of our neighbours had a very fine hound that he thought the best and dearest dog in the world. I loved him, so I loved his dog. And when one day poor Tan crawled home terribly mangled and died by the door, I joined my threats of vengeance with those of his master, and thenceforth lost no opportunity of tracing the miscreant, both by offering rewards and by collecting scraps of evidence. At length it was clear that one of three men to the southward had had a hand in the cruel affair. The scent was warming up, and soon we should have been in a position to exact rigorous justice, at least, from the wretch who had murdered poor old Tan. Then something took place, which at once changed my mind, and led me to believe that the mangling of the old hound was not by any means an unpardonable crime, but indeed, on second thoughts, was rather commendable than otherwise. Gordon Wright's farm lay to the south of us, and while there one day, Gordon Jr., knowing that I was tracking the murderer, took me aside and looking about furtively, he whispered in tragic tones, It was Bing done it. And the matter dropped right there. For I confess that from that moment I did all in my power to baffle the justice I had previously striven so hard to further. I had given Bingo away long before, but the feeling of ownership did not die, and of this indissoluble fellowship of dog and man he was soon to take part in another important illustration. Old Gordon and Oliver were close neighbours and friends. They joined in a contract to cut wood and worked together harmoniously till late on in winter. Then Oliver's old horse died and he, determining to profit as far as possible, dragged it out on the plain and laid poison baits for wolves around it. Alas for poor Bingo! He would lead a wolfish life, though again and again it brought him into wolfish misfortunes. He was as fond of dead horse as any of his wild kindred. That very night, with Wright's own dog Curly, he visited the carcass. It seemed as though Bing had busied himself chiefly keeping off the wolves, but Curly feasted immoderately. The tracks in the snow told the story of the banquet, the interruption as the poison began to work, and of the dreadful spasms of pain during the erratic course back home, where Curly, falling in convulsions at Gordon's feet, died in the greatest agony. Love me, love my dog. No explanations or apology were acceptable. It was useless to urge that it was accidental, the long-standing feud between Bingo and Oliver was now remembered as an important sidelight. The wood contract was thrown up, all friendly relations ceased, and to this day there is no county big enough to hold the rival factions which were called at once into existence and to arms by Curly's dying yell. It was months before Bingo really recovered from the poison. We believed indeed that he never again would be the sturdy old-time Bingo, but when the spring came, he began to gain strength, and bettering as the grass grew, he was within a few weeks once more in full health and vigour to be a pride to his friends and a nuisance to his neighbours. 7. Changes took me far away from Manitoba, and on my return in 1886, Bingo was still a member of Wright's household. I thought he would have forgotten me after two years' absence, but not so. One day, early in the winter, after having been lost for forty-eight hours, he crawled home to rights with a wolf trap and a heavy log fast to one foot, and the foot frozen to stony hardness. No one had been able to approach to help him. He was so savage. When I, the stranger now, stooped down and laid hold of the trap with one hand and his leg with the other, instantly he seized my wrist in his teeth. Without stirring, I said, Bing! Don't you know me? He had not broken the skin, and at once released his hold, and offered no further resistance, although he whined a good deal during the removal of the trap. He still acknowledged me his master in spite of his change of residence and my long absence, and notwithstanding my surrender of ownership, I still felt that he was my dog. Bing was carried into the house much against his will, and his frozen foot thawed out. During the rest of the winter he went lame, and two of his toes eventually dropped off. But before the return of warm weather, his health and strength were fully restored, and to a casual glance he bore no mark of his dreadful experience in the steel trap. 
8. During that same winter, I caught many wolves and foxes who did not have Bingo's good luck in escaping the traps, which I kept out right into the spring, for bounties are good even when fur is not. Kennedy's Plain was always a good trapping ground because it was unfrequented by man and yet lay between the heavy woods and the settlement. I had been fortunate with the fur here, and late in April rode in on one of my regular rounds. The wolf traps are made of heavy steel and have two springs, each of one hundred pounds power. They are set in fours around a buried bait, and after being strongly fastened to concealed logs are carefully covered in cotton and in fine sand so as to be quite invisible. A prairie wolf was caught in one of these. I killed him with a club, and throwing him aside, proceeded to reset the trap as I had done so many hundred times before. All was quickly done. I threw the trap wrench over toward the pony, and seeing some fine sand nearby, I reached out for a handful of it to add a good finish to the setting. Oh, unlucky thought! Oh, mad heedlessness born of long immunity! That fine sand was on the next wolf trap, and in an instant I was a prisoner. Although not wounded, for the traps have no teeth, and my thick trapping gloves deadened the snap, I was firmly caught across the hand above the knuckles. Not greatly alarmed at this, I tried to reach the trap wrench with my right foot. Stretching out at full length, face downward, I worked myself toward it, making my imprisoned arm as long and straight as possible. I could not see and reach at the same time, but counted on my toe telling me when I touched the little iron key to my fetters. My first effort was a failure. Strain as I might at the chain, my toe struck no metal. I swung slowly around my anchor, but still failed. Then a painfully taken observation showed I was much too far to the west. I set about working around, tapping blindly with my toe to discover the key. Thus, wildly groping with my right foot, I forgot about the other till there was a sharp clank and the iron jaws of trap no five closed tight on my left foot. The terrors of the situation did not at first impress me, but I soon found that all my struggles were in vain. I could not get free from either trap or move the traps together, and there I lay stretched out and firmly staked to the ground. What would become of me now? There was not much danger of freezing for the cold weather was over, but Kennedy's plain was never visited by the winter woodcutters. No one knew where I had gone, and unless I could manage to free myself, there was no prospect ahead but to be devoured by wolves or else die of cold and starvation. As I lay there, the red sun went down over the spruce swamp west of the plain, and a shorelark on a gopher mound a few yards off twittered his evening song, just as one had done the night before at our shanty door, and though the numb pains were creeping up my arm and a deadly chill possessed me, I noticed how long his little ear tufts were. Then my thoughts went to the comfortable supper table at Wright's shanty, and I thought, now they are frying the pork for supper, or just sitting down. My pony still stood as I left him with his bridle on the ground, patiently waiting to take me home. He did not understand the long delay, and when I called, he ceased nibbling the grass and looked at me in dumb, helpless inquiry. If he would only go home, the empty saddle might tell the tale and bring help, but his very faithfulness kept him waiting hour after hour while I was perishing of cold and hunger. Then I remembered how old Giroux the trapper had been lost, and in the following spring his comrades found his skeleton held by the leg in a bear trap. I wondered which part of my clothing would show my identity. Then a new thought came to me. This is how a wolf feels when he is trapped. Oh, what misery have I been responsible for? Now I'm to pay for it. Night came slowly on. A prairie wolf howled, the pony pricked up his ears, and walking nearer to me, stood with his head down. Then another prairie wolf howled, and another, and I could make out that they were gathering in the neighbourhood. There I lay prone and helpless, wondering if it would not be strictly just that they should come and tear me to pieces. I heard them calling for a long time before I realised that dim, shadowy forms were sneaking near. The horse saw them first, and his terrified snort drove them back at first, 
but they came nearer next time and sat around me on the prairie. Soon, one bolder than the others crawled up and tugged at the body of his dead relative. I shouted and he retreated, growling. The pony ran to a distance in terror. Presently, the wolf returned, and after after two or three of these retreats and returns, the body was dragged off and devoured by the rest in a few minutes. After this, they gathered nearer and sat on their haunches to look at me, and the boldest one smelt the rifle and scratched dirt on it. He retreated when I kicked at him with my free foot and shouted, but growing bolder as I grew weaker, he came and snarled right in my face. At this, several others snarled and came up closer, and I realized that I was to be devoured by the foe that I most despised, when suddenly, out of the gloom with a guttural roar, sprang a great black wolf. The prairie wolves scattered like chaff except. The bold one, which seized by the black newcomer, was in a few moments a draggled corpse, and then, oh, horrors! This mighty brute bounded at me, and Bingo, noble Bingo, rubbed his shaggy, panting sides against me and licked my cold face. Bingo! Bing! Old! Boy! Fetch me the trap wrench! Away he went and returned, dragging the rifle, for he knew only that I wanted something. No, Bing, the trap wrench. This time it was my sash, but at last he brought the wrench and wagged his tail in joy that it was right. Reaching out with my free hand, after much difficulty, I unscrewed the pillar nut. The trap fell apart and my hand was released, and a minute later I was free. Bing brought the pony up, and after slowly walking to restore the circulation, I was able to mount. Then, slowly at first, but soon at a gallop, with Bingo as Herald careering and barking ahead, we set out for home, there to learn that the night before, though never taken on the trapping rounds, the brave dog had acted strangely, whimpering and watching the timber trail, and at last, when night came on, in spite of attempts to detain him, he had set out in the gloom, and guided by a knowledge that is beyond us, had reached the spot in time to avenge me as well as set me free. Staunch old Bing, he was a strange dog. Though his heart was with me, he passed me next day with scarcely a look, but responded with alacrity when little Gordon called him to a gopher hunt. And it was so to the end. And to the end, also he lived the wolfish life that he loved, and never failed to seek the winter-killed horses, and found one again with a poisoned bait, and wolfishly bolted that. Then, feeling the pang, set out, not for rights, but to find me, and reach the door of my shanty where I should have been. Next day on returning, I found him dead in the snow with his head on the sill of the door, the door of his puppyhood's days, my dog to the last in his heart of hearts. It was my help he sought, and vainly sought, in the hour of his bitter extremity.